Welcome back, Fight Fans. We're here for yet another episode of Shooting the Shit here on the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network. I am Riley Contact here as always. Uh, we have another great guest for you this week. Before we get to that, obviously, though, I uh, like, would like to plug the sponsor really quick. So uh, if you have any home improvement, uh, indoor or outdoor needs, head over on Facebook to Cornelius & Sons. Uh, like I said, I use them for my house uh, housing needs all the time. Um, I'm pretty worthless when it comes to home construction, uh, home improvement projects. So, again, head to Facebook. Again, that is Cornelius & Sons. Uh, ask for Raul. Um, I know he's been doing a lot of work. He actually had, uh, he's been doing work for an NFL player the last couple weeks. So, uh, like I said, Cornelius and Sons. And, and so, uh, today we have a UFC veteran. Uh, he is currently, uh, with Brave CF. Uh, a lot of that is based out of the Middle East, uh, but it is one of the bigger regional promotions in the world. Um, he is Jose Shorty Torres. How are you doing today, Jose? I'm great, man. I'm alive and, uh, finally back home for a good week and, week and a half. So it, it's nice to be back in Chicago. Awesome. So why is it only a week and a half then? Uh, my manager actually has a fight coming up soon. He's 49 years old. UFC Fight Pass. I'm going to do something special with him. And he's like, hey, man, I've been in this sport for so many years, but I've never actually competed. Um, you know, I've managed fighters. I have uh, own I own a fight promotion. I always train. Why not finally actually get the competition at 49 years old? He's going to do it once in his life. And, and UFC is doing like a nice little leading up to and a documentary. So I'll be down in Atlanta next week. Um, training him for a week and then hopefully down in Florida getting ready for my fight, my rematch. Awesome. And I, obviously, I know you're alluding to, uh, Lex McMahon there, the, uh, Titan FC head. Yes, sir. He's, uh, he's a good guy, man. He's managed me for pretty much my entire, uh, MMA professional career. At least when I got to the UFC, it was a little bit of a con- conflict of interest in Titan FC, but, um, you know, he did get me the proper fights that would showcase my skill, but also give me the challenge to keep on bumping up and, I'm at where I'm at today because of him. Awesome. And yeah, and like I said, you know, like I said, you have, like you said, Lex has been in the sport a long time. So it'll be interesting. Now, uh, just to touch on that really quickly, how much experience does he have? Has, has he, does he have a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu background or anything like that? I know he manages fighters, but how long has he been training? Um, you know, the, the typical person usually does train just stand up. Um, Jiu Jitsu is what he's been getting into for the past year and he's, he's getting a lot better and, you know, for being in a sport for so long, you start to, especially watching it so much, you naturally start to catch on a little quicker than the average person. But he's, you know, 49 years old. It's it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, but he's catching on really, really fast. And doing this, it's funny because usually he's picking on me during my training camp. Now I finally get to go back, be fat and happy and pick on him. And, um, you know, I'm excited to put him through some pain because, again, it is very, very different. Tides have turned. And he's going to be exhausted. He's going to be cranky. He's going to be this and that. So it's nice to have someone who's finally going to be able to, be able to understand the full training camp sense, not just the fight, but everything behind the scenes. And again, you know, Lex, Lex, you know, is a Marine. He's just one of those guys that loves to work hard. So being in this, you know, thing is going to make him feel like home, you know, make it feel like it's, he's back at home, but it's the fact of now it's a little different. Now you understand fully how it is to be a professional MMA fighter. And it gets extremely strenuous. So I'm excited to see how he handles it. Yeah, now, and you may not be in a know on this, but will Lex be headlining that card or will he be taking a feature spot? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty confident, though, that he will be the main event because UFC Fight Pass is, again, doing this whole story on it, highlighting it. Um, and I believe, uh, it's, it's not through Titan FC, it's through a different promotion. I believe in the Dominican Republic, but I mean, overall, man, it's, if, when you have camera crews and all that stuff as big as UFC Fight Pass coming in, I would be pretty confident he would be the main event. For sure. Now, you had said before we get into your, uh, your most recent fight and obviously your next fight, uh, now you grew up in the Chicago area. We have a lot, most of our viewers here are from Illinois. Uh, so just kind of give us the background. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to high school? And then what are you doing now? And where do you live in Chicago? What do you do? Yeah, so I grew up in the McKinley Park neighborhood. Pretty much been there, I think, since I was 10 years old. Went to Green Elementary School over there. And then eventually my, my parents split. So I moved to Berwyn for about a year. And I went to Cicero. My parents got back together. And I've been in Cicero ever since. You know, so literally right at the borderline of Chicago. I'm not one of those guys that say I'm from Chicago and then I don't know where you look at their license. They're from like Arlington Heights. That's or me. Kinky <laughs> yeah. There you go. You know, so it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I was born and raised in Chicago and it's, it's, you know, it's my, it's my upbringing. My dad was, uh, 
you know, was one of the, the gangs in Chicago that represented not just the gang, but, you know, his, his legacy. My dad did pass away last year. So my last fight was an homage to him. I wore one of those sweaters back in like the seventies and eighties where the gangs used to wear. And that was the war sweater, you know, like you don't, you didn't approach those people. I don't know if you ever seen, uh, the warriors back in the day where it's like, you know, you have all these different groups walking around with just, you know, their jackets, whether it's leather, cotton, wool, whatever the case may be. And, uh, it's funny, somebody on IG recognized it. They're like, is that a Harrison Jones sweater? Dude, that's, that's old school. That's, that's like, that's a classic. You know, it's a thing that you never watch. You just hang up and, uh, I might have to watch it a little bit for after this fight because I'll sweat. But man, it's, it's, um, yeah, I've been in Chicago all my life. My mom is, you know, born in Mexico, dad born in Puerto Rico and eventually came in Chicago, met there and, you know, born in Illinois Masonic in the North Side. So I'm a Cubs fan. Ah. Uh, always. Always raised in the South, though, so I was always always getting beat up by the by the Sox fans. That's I was right. always bullied. I was the only only Cup fan in my family, still am. But um, man, you know, been in Cicero ever since. You know, was able to do martial arts through the the park districts, and eventually joined Combat Zone Cicero. And ever since then, man, I've been able to uh, because of fighting get out of the neighborhood. You know, it's especially in the city of Chicago. If you're growing up Latino, Black, usually a minority, it. it you know, we're in the neighborhoods of poverty. McKinley Park isn't the richest neighborhood in the world. I actually went back to my old house the other day and, you know, we had the police camera on the corner. I'm like, man, this neighborhood's just getting worse. You know, so it's, um, the upbringing is different. But man, I always say, you know, if I can make it out of Chicago, anybody can make it out of Chicago, you know. So, um, especially with the upbringing of growing up in a trap house and all that stuff. So it's, it's just one of those things, man, that, uh, it, it is, as I always compare Chicago to, uh, Gotham. You know, okay. Chicago is probably the closest thing to Gotham City. And if you can make it out of Gotham, man, you're, you're going to make it somewhere. And for me, it's, I've been traveling all over the world, but I train right now and I'm traveling soon to Florida. A lot of fun out there, man. It's definitely a different environment. And I was actually going to make a post today on Twitter. I'm actually going to make it right after this. It's, it's weird because I go for runs all the time and go for a run in Florida, beautiful weather, run outside. Everyone forcefully says hello especially by my manager's neighborhood, it's all, it's all beautiful houses, you know? So I'm running, I'm like, man, this is awesome. Nice place, nice people. Everyone literally like, hello, hi, hello. And like, you need to say hello back. That's just the, how genuine people are. Like they want to say hello, but they're also super nosy here. Dude, I'm running down the block and I've gotten used to saying hello to people. So I'll, I'll look at someone, I'll be like, Hey, how you doing? And people just like, look up and down, they mean mug me, you can tell they're judging me, and I'm just like, damn, dude. I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot I'm in Chicago. So, like, right. everyone mean mugs you, judge you, like, they all mean well, they're all nice. It's just something you don't do here, you know? Like, yeah. everyone's super nice, but they're going to judge you, complain, and mean mug, uh, mean mug you the entire time. Yeah, it's funny that you said Chicago's like Gotham. I mean, all of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies were actually filmed in Chicago, uh, including yeah. The Dark Knight. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's as close as it gets because, I mean, that's what it was in the movies, too. Um, now, this is kind of a two-part question because I know that you've spent time at ATT in Florida. Uh, obviously, you live in Chicago. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Combat Doe, Pearl, Pearl Gonzalez used to train there as well, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. So uh, when you're in Chicago, what do you miss most about when you're in Florida? And when you're in Florida, what do you miss most about Chicago? There's there's two reasons why I leave the city. And, and probably the two biggest reasons. Just two? One, yeah, just two. I mean, there's definitely more. but the, the two biggest reasons, one is my father always used to tell me, get out of the neighborhood, get out of the neighborhood, get out of the city of Chicago, go train somewhere else. As much as you love you know, representing your home, go represent it somewhere else. And that's what I do. I mean, my dad understood that there are gangs, there's violence. You know, we used to have cameras in front. People have broken our windows. People have, you know, burnt up our cars and flames, you know. So, again, growing up with the upbringing I have, my dad had an understandable reasoning to be like, dude, get the hell out of the neighborhood. It's dangerous. And you know, quick story is, uh, we had a fighter named Ed Brown from Chicago four years ago, maybe five years ago, uh, was a boxer. Our team was called TBT, the broke team. We didn't call each other the money team. It was a broke team, all boxers, nine, 19 and 0, about to make a Showtime boxing debut. And, uh, he, he ends up getting shot four times in, in the neighborhood of Garfield Park. You know, so it's one of those things that he should have got out of the neighborhood. And after that, literally we all split up, you know, so for me, that's one of my bigger reasons just to be safe. And then two is, man, I can't, I can't do my training camp here. There's too much food. There's too much food. I'm actually, I've already visited, I already visited two places that like sponsor me for a promotion with meal. And, um, 
I got two more places coming up. And then I went to just a grocery store right now, all the Latino grocery stores. And it's just like, ooh, piece of candy, ooh, piece of candy. And I'm just literally grabbing stuff when I only went there for some like a carton of milk. And I don't know, I'm spending like $40 literally on just snacks, all bad food. So I'm like, you know what? Let me get it out now. So then next week, you know, I'm done. Dude, I weighed 125 last week. I probably weigh about 155 now, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, I, I put on weight like that. And, uh, I had like a whole carton of like banana bread before I even got on the show. So, and like Mexican bandulce. So I'm, I'm, I'm messing up real bad right now. So I got to get out. <laughs> you sound like another guest we had on recently, Randy Costa, who recently won his fight, but he said, yeah, you know, I came down to Florida to train. I got fats. Then I had to get into training camp and had to get rid of all the fat. And now that he won his fight in the UFC, he says he's gotten fat again. So that's <laughs> not surprising. Yeah, dude, it's, it's one of those things that like, I mean, we have the wrestler mindset. They're like, oh, we do this two month, three month cut, you know, weight cut. And, you know, I lose 30 pounds for the fight. And then by the time the fight's over, it's like, I want to devour everything I see. And that's what we do because it's, it, it's a poor mindset. It really is. Like, it technically is the weak mindset, but it's something we're used to because we're not educated on it. No one taught it different when, you know, when we're younger, where right after we're finished cutting weight we don't eat healthy we're just like devouring food because we're like we never know when we're gonna have to start cutting weight again right. so let's enjoy this food while we still can and then we have to cut weight even more it's so for me you know i do have an immediate rematch coming up soon so i have to uh enjoy myself for you know five six days at most seven for this week and then get the hell out and then you know start working on my weight again so uh it'll be easier to get back to it because it's only a week but i've had times where I don't, you know, have anything planned for like another two months and I just devour food, man. It, it, I have to do a training camp just to get in training camp. So it takes time. Yeah, that's uh, that's the problem I don't think I could ever do as a fighter. I wouldn't be able to cut enough weight because I just am not disciplined enough with my diet. Um, so, you know, unless they added uh, – see, I'm in that weight where uh, it's either light heavyweight, heavyweight, or middleweight. Mm -hmm. And there's no cruiserweight, you know, a cruiserweight would be ideal. You know, I'm too small to be a heavyweight and probably not big enough to be a light heavyweight either, but I'm not cutting to 85. So that would... Well, they, they call me, they call me baby gas lumps. And sometimes I can fight lightweight. Maybe I can <laughs> even go to the welterweight sometimes. You do? There's a little bit of a resemblance with you and Kelvin, a little bit. Well, now, now I have literally the, the faux hawk, so we resemble each other very much. And I even had my hair longer to where it was curling down <laughs> and uh, like, my my mother just put up one of those uh those little square sticky pictures you can put on the wall now that you see all over like online right. and uh I'm like damn I was fat okay <laughs> that makes that makes sense and it's no offense to Gaslam like Gaslam's just bigger than me naturally right. but I'm just like damn all right that makes sense I can't even I can't even deny it you know so it's it's crazy that when I'm fat I look like Calvin Gaslam when I'm skinny for some reason my beard goes a little ginger. And I get like the emaciated look a little bit. So I look like Conor McGregor <laughs> and I'm just like, I just want to look like me. That's all I want to do. <laughs> yeah. You just want to be your own brand at one point. Um, so now you had mentioned, uh, you, your, your, uh, fight with Brave CF over the weekend. I will admit I did not see it. I, I, I was watching about three other different promotions at the time. Um, so just kind of break down how the fight, how you think the fight wins. Obviously it went to a draw. So there was no winner. I believe it was in that Brave, uh, flyweight tournament. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of answered it, but, you know, what's next? I believe you'll be taking on Santella next. What do you got to do differently to come out victorious? You know, my – and Dean Thomas told me, and, and I knew what I needed to do, but with a year and four-month layoff more because of mentality than, than physicality, um, you know, mental injury is a huge thing. That's why I've been preaching a lot of mental health stuff in my, my post and all that. But going in there, man, I was so anxious. It was just self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. It was more of like everything's going – perfect for this camp what if i mess it up you know so it's, it's literally that the entire time and i usually start slow and i knew he was going to try to take advantage of it and so the first round i'm like whatever he ended up going i can't remember the actual drop but it's pretty much like a heel hook and um it's it's set it up it's like a, a knee sweep to a heel hook and i was wasn't even stuck in the hook but i'm just waiting there and people for people who don't know it's a 50 50 guard so you're just stuck in a sense scissoring on the floor but the thing is, he's in the dominant position since he went for it. And because it looks like he's going for a submission, the ref can't say anything up. So I'm down there for like three, four minutes. And then by the time I got back up, he took my back. And I'm just kind of like, man, this guy's a spider. He's, he's like, it's just a prey that he's not letting go. But he's not submitting me and he's not hurting me. So I'm like, 
it's it's boring to me because I want to put on an exciting fight. But when you look at it, when it comes to the technical BJJ standpoint, like his skills beyond you know what I even expected. And I've rolled with him before, and I'm like, man, this guy's 35, getting older, and he's getting better. You know, so I'm just like, okay, this guy's good. I know what to do in the second round. The second round, he goes for a shot. I just start um, just throwing hands like uh, it was like he shot in, sprawled, and I'm just punching, punching, punching. And I literally made the smallest mistake in not thinking about he was going to swim move and take my back. And uh, I got two into the punch and he swam, you know, he swam his arm out, took my back. And I'm like, damn it. Like, okay, like I got to get out. But he was so elusive and always trying to go for a submission that it was either I'm playing defense or trying to get out, playing defense, trying to get out. So it took me a good three minutes to get out. By the time I got out, I already lost the round, no matter what I would have done unless I knocked him out. So I'm like, damn, I'm down two rounds and none. I might lose this fight against a guy I call the first round knockout with because stand up wise, I dominate. And I'm like, he's not tapping me out. He's not hurting me, but because he's going through the submissions and taking down my positions, he's, he's winning. He's clearly winning. And so, um, like even when he had me in positions, I'm clearly punching him more than he's hitting me, but you know, it's a downward position. Anyways, third round comes and because he's been working so hard, um, to try to submit me, he's exhausted himself. So in that third round, I just start throwing haymakers and going, going, going. He shoots in, bad shot, take his back, and I'm just punching, 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 not even trying to do jiu-jitsu with a jiu-jitsu guy. I'm just trying to, to finish him, trying to get the ref to stop the fight. And uh, he did enough to survive, And but because it was such uh, more of an onslaught in the third round by me, two judges saw it as a 10-8 uh, round. So by the time the scorecards came out, one judge saw it 10-9, or uh, I was like 30, 30, 28. And then the other judges saw it um, 28, 28 all the way through. So it ended up being a majority draw. Yeah. So it was like, oh, well, I guess we're going to have to fight again. And I, I really wish uh, Brave would have put in the contract clause because, again, it is a tournament. You need a winner. I wish they would have put like, hey, if it goes to a draw, Sunday. there's a fourth round, yeah. you know, but – Sadly, and that would have been in my favor because he was so exhausted. But, you know, sadly, it just like, hey, we're going to have to do a rematch um, sometime later on in the year. So that's what I'm getting ready for. Obviously, uh, I can't announce it because it's not even confirmed yet by me. Um, no no contracts yet. But it's it's actually the, the best case scenario for both of us. You know, we're going to come out a lot stronger in the second fight. Um, so it's definitely that much more fan entertaining because we did win fight in the night. Um, we already know what's going to happen. So it's going to be just that much more challenging where it's more of a chess match as it already was. And that, I hate chess. And then the last one is we get to stay active. We were both gone for about a year and a year and a half. You know, my, me from, because of mental issues, my father's passing him, his, his mother, um, had cancer, you know? So it was one of those things that like both of us taking care of like personal issues, finally to come back to this. And maybe having some anxiety, like I definitely had, and I'm pretty sure he had too. You know, now it's like we're going to come back that much stronger. So, uh, you know, we're both happy. We're both very respectful to each other, very mutual. And, uh, dude, it's it's going to be an all-out war, hopefully, at the end of the year. Yeah, and that's one to look forward to. Like I said, I was unable to see it. I saw a couple of small clips. Um, but it looked like a really exciting fight. And obviously, you earned fight of the night. So that's, of course, true that it was, you know, an exciting fight. Um, you know, Santella, we have the running joke, a couple of colleagues of mine. He's been a, a top flyweight prospect since 1927. Um, it's yeah. like he's been around forever. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a tough guy right there. So, um, you know, with Brave putting on as many cards as they have been since they've reopened, which has actually been really nice to see, uh, you would, do you think you'll be able to fight by year's end? Yeah. What they have planned is hopefully November, December. You know, it just depends on the actual date, the location. Cause again, most of the countries they've been going to are in Europe. We're American. We can't stay in Europe. There is a travel ban um, unless they go to possibly Russia, possibly the Middle East, possibly somewhere in Asia. Or again, I don't know if there's a travel ban in Africa or Australia, but maybe those two places that they've been to before. So that's the hard part. Um, you know, it just depends on, on them because we are both American. You know, so uh, we, we said we'd settle it in the rock paper scissors match uh after the fight but they didn't want that so we're just waiting. i don't want to do a, a thumb war because he's too slick with that so i'm just trying to to figure out what's next but overall enjoying myself this week not trying to really go go too too crazy on on um you know working out and killing myself i just want to be able to enjoy myself enjoy time with family and uh, have some fun 
for sure. And then, yeah, to touch on a point you had earlier, you know, I, I just, yeah, for any tournament bout to not have a, uh, an overtime round, if it were to go to a draw or, you know, something like that, it is really, I don't want to say bad planning, but it's a kind of an oversight that you, you can't have in a tournament format. You know, the one I always think of is, uh, the Ultimate Fighter show. You know, they, they their, their third round is the overtime round. But as far as I think it happened once in the show, um, if it went to a third round and it was a draw, they did go end up going to a fourth round. So, yeah, that's unfor- unfortunate planning, but not always something you think of right off the top of your head when uh, when you're planning these things out. So uh, we will definitely look forward to hearing that uh, fight announcement from you against Sean Santella again. I will definitely be queuing in. Hopefully there's not a bunch of uh, fights happening that morning so I can actually watch that one and not have three different screens going. So Yeah. <laughs> that there was a lot of stuff on that morning, and that's a good that's a good sign that shows MMA is back. Um, so uh, let's get to the UFC event this weekend. Uh, first off, not the greatest card they've offered. I'm actually surprised it's an ESPN mainstream card instead of an ESPN Plus card, given the lack of name on there. The two biggest fights are women's fights, and the second one isn't even the co-main event, which is kind of weird. And then you have a guy like Carlos Condit, who's on the preliminary card, when why wouldn't he be on the main card? Uh, but we'll just talk about the main event. Uh, you have former UFC champion uh, Holly Holm. Uh, she will be taking on up-and-coming Mexican star Irene Aldana. Uh, so why don't you just kind of break down what you see in these two fighters, and then if you got a prediction, throw it our way. You know, they're both phenomenal fighters. You know, the Mexican is, is very forward, very aggressive. Holly Holm, man, she's the preacher's daughter. She's been around for years. The only problem is she just has never been the same after Misha Tate. Um, you know, she had her highlight with Ronda Rousey. That's amazing, which she was a huge underdog in that fight. Um, came and did her thing, but I feel like that day was a um, – never, ever going to say it was a lucky fight. Never, because she was just spot on. It's just one of those days where you completely showed up and Ronda just – I think Ronda performed at her best, but it was just Holly, once she's at her best, it's she's – Really, really unstoppable. And it's time, Ronda. A lot of people are now catching on to Ronda's techniques. Um, but after that, man, Holly Holmes, she's, she's been getting beat up. You know, she finally got tapped out by or choked out by Misha Tate. She got knocked out by Amanda Nunez. She's been struggling with other fighters as well. You know, it's not been like she's been dominating people. So I believe this Mexican fighter, especially the way the UFC is trying to highlight her, you know, Mexico obviously is behind there. All the Mexicans usually just flock together and we're just like, yeah, I don't know who you are, but yeah, you know, so, um, I think it's, it's a great opportunity for the Mexican and being able to push forward and, and how aggressive she naturally is. I mean, you look at Alexa Grasso, even in her last fight, how aggressive they are, how many combinations they go. You look at myself. I literally do nothing but walk forward. I literally was never taught how to move back. <laughs> like, it's just one of those things that, Latino fighters, especially Mexicans, were just resilient. I believe this one's going to be at a great advantage. As long as she makes it a kickboxing fight and not a sole boxing fight, I think she has the advantage here, especially with the youth, the conditioning. And right now she's a hype train. So, you know, I'm going to give it to the Mexican fighter. Oh, so you're going to take Aldana over home in this one. Interesting, interesting. I mean, I think this definitely is most likely going to be a glorified kickboxing match. I don't see too much grappling coming here unless – you know, Holm wants to try. I mean, Holm actually has underrated wrestling. I think it's because she's so physically, you know, physically strong. Um, but I don't think, you know, a world champion boxer like her is going to have any problem uh, meeting Eldon on the feet. And you're right. This is going to be a firefight while it lasts. I don't think this will fe- see the judges, to be quite frank. I'm going to go the opposite with you. I will take Holly Holm here. I think that her striking is on another level. But, uh, you know, like I said, Eldon is somebody that I like because of her style. And someone, like I said, you know, the UFC likes to market into Mexico. She's somebody that you could definitely market there. Um, and, you know, without, you know, the Cain Velasquez's of the world, you know, who, who is that face you market there? Obviously, Yair Rodriguez is one of them, but you need more than one, uh, in my opinion, to market into that, that you know, the entire country. But uh, <laughs> it's funny when you said uh, that, uh, you know, when, when the Mexican fighters all, we all band together, I thought of an old, I, I, I hate Carlos Mencia because I think he's a terrible comedian, but he had a great joke that was similar. He said, um, when a, a Puerto Rican or a Mexican boxer goes against an American boxer, you know, We'll go from, you know, fighting with each other like, oh, we're together tonight, but then tomorrow they go back to not fighting yeah. each other. <laughs> so, that's, was, honestly, that's usually how it is. But in boxing, you know, Mexico versus Puerto Rico, again, De La Hoya versus Trinidad, you know, Canelo or uh, Canelo versus anyone, Cotto versus anyone, you know, it's just one of those things that, like, I don't know where it becomes one-sided or it's just Mexico versus Puerto Rico and it's just clashing all the time. But, man, you know, one thing I can't, I can't give the Holly home is, 
when she's facing a very experienced striker, you look at one huge advantage. She does have the wrestling. And you look at her fight against Megan Anderson. Megan Anderson is nowhere near the striker as Holly Holm. But man, she could crack. You know, in that, in that fight, Holly's like, ah, you know what? I'm going to take you down. And that whole fight, she took her down, just held her down. She didn't do any, she didn't do much, but she held her down and won the fight because of it. So, you know, can the Mexican fighter, you know, uh, have some scrambling ability on the ground as well? Because I believe that's what she's going to need. Because I, I do see Holly trying to take this fight down to the ground, using the boxing, maybe throwing a head kick here and there. And then trying to go for uh, takedowns and solidify the fight there. But, you know, I believe the Mexican fighters prepared for everything. Yeah, and that's a good point. And I believe that that home Anderson fight, I was at that fight. I can't remember. I had a few too many of these. But that was the fight in Chicago that I, I believe uh-huh. I was there for. And, uh, yeah, um, I, I agree. Like I mentioned before, I think Holmes under wrestling is actually underrated now. And, like, kind of what you were saying in terms of her activity from the top position, you know, she ain't going to be, you know, confused for Hoist Gracie anytime soon mm-hmm. in terms of activity. Um, but it's effective and she's physically strong and she's very good at not letting people get back up because she is so physically strong. So, you know, she might do that to seal rounds. She might use it at the end of the round. If she doesn't, you, she could, she could kickbox for four minutes and then just get the wrestling takedown, you know, to, to, to cinch the round. And then, you know, or, or if she, if she gets tagged by Aldana, who has a lot of power, she could do that as a, as a fail safe. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So we have, uh, we have contradicting though. I'm taking home. You're taking Aldana. Uh, no big deal. Uh, we'll, we'll say the, uh, the winner gets Portillo's when you're allowed to, uh, to actually <laughs> eat again, uh, when it's all said and done. So, Jose, we want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been awesome having you here. It's always nice to have a, um, a local fighter on here since a lot of our audience is localized. Uh, before I let you go, feel free to plug yourself, pour yourself away. Uh, where can we find you? Would you anybody else you'd want to thank? Uh, man, yeah, I definitely thank all my sponsors and everyone who helped me out in this fight. I wouldn't be where I'm at today if we're, you know, working for everyone's help. And that's why I always do say we can, we will together. We are Team Shorty, and it brings me to my next topic, which I do have my own foundation called the Team Shorty Foundation. You know, you follow that on all social media platforms. And all I'm doing is everything on my website, teamshorty.com, 100% of the proceeds go to my foundation to help kids, teens, and young adults inside the gym and off the streets. And for all the kids right now inside you know, not going to school, you know, because of COVID and being online. I'm actually right now donating to another foundation called Youth Crossroads um, and trying to find a company that wants to help support pretty much outdoor, you know, activities again. You know, get the kids back in the sandlot playing baseball, basketball, football, whatever the case may be. So I've already donated to, uh, to them money-wise. I want to be able to donate now when it comes to sports equipment, everything through the Team Shorty Foundation. And uh, it's a huge thing. It gives, it gives kids a different opportunity, not just to – try to be a professional athlete like myself, but learn some responsibility, get a proper, you know, father figure, mother figure, mentors, and uh, just get a different opportunity in life. That's a really, really important thing. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you plugged that because I was unaware of that myself. And, and that's something I've had, uh, you know, conversations with a lot of my Chicago friends is having that, having those resources available to get kids off the street and get them interested in sports and, you know, doing something that can get them away from something that could get them up to no good and having those positive role models. I've been a coach myself for five or six years in various sports. So, um, awesome. I, I, I'm also going to make sure to post that uh, when we post the video as well, because I think that's important. So thank you very much for plugging that. That's really important work. Um, I will plug myself right now since I am a, a whore, uh, if you will. Uh, you can make sure to uh, find all of my work at Combat Press, MMA Intel, wherever else. I am now also writing for Invicta FC. Um, looking to get a few uh, history pieces out on the flyweight and strawweight championships for that organization, so keep an eye out on InvictaFC.com. Uh, other than that, you can check me out on Facebook and Twitter. You know where that's at. Uh, Jose, thank you again for coming on the show. We really do look forward to uh, seeing you scrap with Sean Santella for a second time, and hopefully it results in you advancing in that Brave Flyweight tournament. Fingers crossed, man. I appreciate your time. Take care of yourself. You too. All right. So for Jose Soares, I am Riley Contex saying continue to watch the fights. Continue to watch the fight, the show. I can't even get my own outro out. Go fuck yourselves. Have a good night.